Section 1.1. Be reasonable. Objective 1. Explain the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning. Consider this scenario. A friend invites you to their new apartment a few blocks away from where you live. It's a nice day, and you decide to walk over. On the way, you notice a dog loose in someone's yard, but it seems like a nice doggy, so you don't think much, and you reach your hand in to give the dog some scratches. Right, we've all done this. The dog runs up to you, but bites your leg. So let's discuss whether or not you're likely to take the same path next time to your friend's house, assuming you can get there a different way. Include both an argument for why you would take the same route and an argument why you would not. So the green text, that's going to be our answer. So an argument for taking the same route. You might reason that the dog's behavior is isolated, an incident, or misunderstanding. Not all dogs... Uh, that approach are aggressive and many are friendly. If you had a positive experience with the dog in the past, you might believe that this was an exception rather than the norm. Convenience. It could also be convenience that the path is more direct and it's a pleasant route to your friend's apartment, avoiding longer walks or less scenic streets. Um, convenience often plays a significant role in decision making, so that's an argument to take the same route. It might not happen again. Maybe the dog was just in a bad mood, or maybe you approached the dog too fast, right? So, an argument for not taking the same route. Fear of reoccurrence. The bite could instill fear or caution in you regarding the specific route. Even if the dog's behavior was unusual, the experience might make you hesitant to risk encountering it again. So, you might not want to again, because you're like, oh, I don't know, this dog really got me this time. I don't want to. And then safety concerns. Once bitten, twice shy, the, uh, it, th that adage might apply. So, concerns about safety and the potential for further incidents could outweigh the benefits of the familiar path. Ultimately, the decision might depend on your individual risk tolerance, prior experience of dogs, and how significant the bite was in terms of physical harm and emotional impact. Okay, let's consider a similar scenario. Suppose you decide to take the same path the next day. When passing the same house, the dog begins to run towards you and bark. Discuss how this might affect your thoughts on this particular route to your friend's apartment. So let's say the next day you decide to take that same path, but the dog is reacting the same. So you might have increased caution. This behavior reinforces the idea that the dog might pose a threat or is territorial. Your perception of the risk associated with the route could increase significantly. Avoidance. The negative reinforcement of the dog's behavior might lead you to actively avoid the path in the future, opting for alternative routes even if they are less convenient. Assuming that you would find a different way to get to your friend's place next time, you have what you you have used what you, uh, is called inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that arrives at a general conclusion based on the observation of specific examples. So inductive reasoning is you came up with a conclusion based off observations, things that have actually happened. You're still walking on the shortest path to your friend's new place, but on one street, you notice that there's a big hole in the sidewalk where construction is being done with no way to get around it. Discuss whether or not you're likely to take the same path the next day. Would you have to fall in the hole to decide? So say you take a different path and there's a huge hole in the street. The next day, you wouldn't need to fall into the hole to decide, maybe I shouldn't go that way because a hole is going to take some time to be fixed. You wouldn't necessarily need to fall into the hole to decide. The visual confirmation of the hazard and your assessment of its risk would likely be sufficient to influence your decision making. Safety concerns are typically more straightforward in terms of decision making compared to uncertain variables like dog behavior. Therefore, the presence of a visible hazard like a hole in the sidewalk could prompt you to choose an alternative route without needing a negative incident to occur first. There is a clear difference between these two scenarios. In the second, you would not need to fall into the hole twice to decide that a different route would be a good idea. At, at least I hope you would not. Instead, you would deduce from a known principle the walking along the sidewalk would not work. The, word, the use of the word deduce, it's important here. This is called deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that arrives at a conclusion based on previous accepted general statements. It does not rely on specific examples. So inductive reasoning is happening, you observe things that are happening, so you come with a come up with a conclusion. Deductive reasoning, you are just using general statements to understand maybe we should do this or not do this.
Example 1. Let's decide whether inductive or deductive reasoning was used to draw the conclusion and explain your choice. So, the last six uh, times we played our arch rival in football, we won. So, I know we're going to win on Saturday. This is called inductive reasoning. The reason why it's called inductive reasoning, because this conclusion is based on observing a pattern, you won the last six games, and extrapolating that the pattern will continue in the further, we're going to win on Saturday. Inductive reasoning involves making generalizations based on specific observations or instances. Alright, so B. There is no mail delivery on holidays. Tomorrow is Labor Day, so I know there will be no mail. This is deductive reasoning. Why is it deductive reasoning? This conclusion follows deductive reasoning because it derives from a general rule. No mail delivers on holidays, and it applies to uh, it to a specific instant, Labor Day. So you're using deductive reasoning, and that involves drawing, a conclusion spe uh, drawing specific conclusions from general principles or rules. Part C. The syllabus states that any final grade between 80 and 90 will result in a B. I got 80 and uh, 82 on my first two tests, and I got a 78% on my final. My overall average will be 80.1%. This means, or that means I will get a B. This is deductive reasoning. The reason why it is deductive reasoning, the conclusion is reached by applying a known rule, that you have the syllabus criteria for what a B it needs to be, so that you can apply that rule to a specific numerical score, 80 and an 82 on the first test, and a projected 70%, 78% on the final, the conclusion logically follows from the application of these specific instances to a general rule provided by the syllabus. All right, D, all birds can fly, an ostrich is a bird, therefore ostriches can fly. This is deductive reasoning. Although this argument follows deductive reasoning by applying a general principle, all birds can fly, to a specific case, an ostrich, we know that this is flawed because the initial premise, all birds can fly, is factually incorrect. Not all birds can fly. Therefore, while this structure is deductive, the argument is invalid due to false premise. Let's use uh, inductive reasoning to make conjectures. I'm sure you've heard these words, conjectures, and stuff like that when you're watching law shows or court shows, stuff like that. Let's consider the scenario. If you add two odd numbers together, what will the result look like? You are, uh, you are to guess that the sum of every pair of, I suppose to say odd, numbers has a certain property. But there is no way you can actually test every pair of odd numbers because there are infinitely many to test. There's an infinite amount of numbers, so you can't actually test that. And that's a big issue with inductive reasoning. It is an incredibly useful tool in decision making, but in most cases you cannot verify a conclusion for every possible case. So you cannot be 100% certain that your conclusion is valid. Suppose that your history professor gives you a, a surprise quiz every Friday for the first four weeks of class. At this point, you might use inductive reasoning to conjecture that you will have a quiz every Friday, but you cannot look into the future and know for sure, so it's entirely possible that the conjecture is not true. In fact, that first time you don't have a quiz on Friday makes your conjecture false. This is a really useful observation. While it can be difficult to prove that a conjecture is true, it is much simpler to prove that it is false. All you need to do is find one specific example that contradicts the conjecture. This is known as counterexamples. A counterexample is a single specific example that violates a conjecture. Even one counterexample is enough to prove that a conjecture is false. Example two, create a counterexample of each conjecture. All prime numbers are odd. The number two is a prime number, but it is the, it, it's even. So not all prime numbers are odd. There you go we found a counterexample to our conjecture. So a conjecture is kind of like an idea, a, a guess, a hypothesis, if you want to like equate it to that. And a counterexample is a way to prove it being wrong or right. B, all people prefer summer over winter. Well, I can have a counterexample right now. That is not true. Some people like winter over summer. We don't associate with those people, but they're out there. They exist. Inductive reasoning can be used to give you a really good idea that something may be true, but most often it cannot be used to prove that it is true. 
Let's use deductive reasoning to prove or disprove a conjecture. Think of any number. Multiply that number by 3, then add 30, and divide the result by 3. Next, subtract the original number. What's the result? Then we're going to use inductive reasoning to make a conjecture for the answer, and then use deductive reasoning to prove your conjecture. So I'm going to think of a number. I thought of a number, and I thought of the number 4. Okay, so now we're going to take that number and multiply it by 3. So 4 times 3, we get 12. Now we're going to add 30 to it. So 12 plus 30, we get 42. Divide that result by 3. So 42 divided by 3, we get 14. Now it's telling us to subtract the original number. So 14 minus 4, we get 10. The result is 10. Inductive reasoning conjecture. Based on the calculation above, it appears that regardless the number uh, chosen, as long as it operates as a f uh, uh, operations are followed correctly, meaning you did the first the five steps correctly, the results after performing the operations described, multiply by 3, add 30, divide by 3, subtract the original number, is always 10. So the conjecture, the idea we're having is that no matter what number you pick, it's always going to be 10. So after performing the operations, uh, the result is always 10. That's our idea, our conjecture. So let's use deductive reasoning to prove this conjecture. We're going to let x represent any number. You can pick any number. When we say pick any number in math, we're actually saying pick x. So x, that's going to be the original number. So our original number is x. Then we're going to multiply that by 3. So 3 times x, we get 3x. Now we're going to add 30, so 3x plus 30. We can't really combine those because it's 3x, it's 30. They're different, they're not the same. Now that we uh, added 30, it, the next step is to divide by 3. So 3x plus 30 divided by 3, because they all have 3 in common, it actually simplifies down to x plus 10. And then it told us to subtract the original number, so the original number is x. Uh, so x plus 10 minus x, you're always going to get 10. Therefore, deductively, regardless of the initial number x, the final resort, result after performing the specific operations is always 10. Example 4. For the conjecture, prove its truth value. So a truth value is saying this is true, this is false. Nothing in between. If false, let's provide a counterexample. If true, use deductive reasoning to prove it. A. The square of every real number is greater than the number itself. So, the conjecture, the idea. For any real number, any number, x, we're saying that the square of it is always greater than the number itself. That is false. How I know it's false? Let's say x is 0. So 0 squared is 0. 0 is not greater than 0. So a is actually false because we proved if you square the number 0, you get 0. 0 is not greater than 0. It's equal, it's the same, but it's not greater. All right, B, all continents have at least one desert. So we're going to use deductive reasoning to figure out if that's true. So Asia, they have several de deserts. Uh, the Arabian, all, like many, many deserts. Africa, we know they have the Sahara, the Kalahari, all these deserts. North America, we have the Sonora, the Mojave, the, Chihu the uh, Chihuahuan Desert. South America, they have a desert. The Patagonia Desert, we're really associated with that. Europe has deserts. Spain actually has deserts. Um, Australia has deserts, right? Australia is just one massive desert. So based on this analysis, we have deductive proof. Each continent listed above uh, has been shown to have at least one desert. Since the continents mentioned Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Europe, and Australia collectively cover all major inhabited continents, we can do that the statement all continents have at least one desert is true. Therefore, using deductive reasoning and examining the presence of deserts on each continent, we can conclude that the conjecture is true.